So I'd like to introduce our next speaker, who is John West, who's going to talk to us about integrated pest management for diseases. Over to you, John. OK, Lynn, thanks very much. Hopefully you can hear me. Is that correct? You can hear me OK? Yes, I can hear you, John. Good. Uh, OK, so next slide, please, Laura. OK, well, um, as Lynn mentioned in the introduction, and hopefully we'll be able to get back to James's talk at the end, um, our focus has been on integrated pest and disease management, and that really uh, is a fusion of different approaches, some of them long term kind of traditional or green uh, methods you could think of like rotations, choosing resistant varieties and managing soil and weeds um, to um, reduce disease pressure. But there's also uh, a need for to be reactive and that means targeting sprays only when needed. And this could of course be a spray with a biological, but for most people it's a fungicide. Now we've used uh, all of these different uh, approaches to monitoring you can see on the screen, uh, but for this talk uh, I'm going to focus on the two at the top right hand side, which is weather based forecasts and inoculum based forecasts, because these are the way we can get a much earlier heads up of imminent disease pressure uh, to allow a, a preventative spray uh, before uh, the disease really takes hold. So next slide, please. So for many years, um, colleagues uh, and I have um, put out uh, forecasts for two important diseases of oilseed rape, FOMA stem canker and light leaf spot. Um, now these uh, are actually are quite different in that the Sorry, if you can just go back one slide. Um, the, the two forecasts are, um, are for FOMA, where the key thing is trying to work out when to spray, uh, whereas for light leaf spot, the key thing is to understand whether to spray at all from the uh, expecting disease pressure. And the reason for that is that FOMA leaf spot uh, which is a problem in the southern half of the country uh, causing stem canker. Um, that actually uh, can start at different times in the autumn and that the, the start of that varies by at least a month uh, at any one place in the country. Uh, whereas light leaf spot, the spores that initiate that uh, are already in the air all through the summer and the beginning of the autumn. So as the oilseed rape plants emerge, they're already um, becoming infected, but that the, the spore release for light leaf spot is very sporadic. Uh, so there are times when there aren't spores about and also it has a very, very long incubation period. So so the forecast for light leaf spot is a bit different and it's, it's predicting whether it's going to be a severe year or not, really, um, by giving a measure of the percentage of crops that will have more than 25 percent of plants affected. Uh, and so uh, for that particular one, there's a forecast done initially in the autumn um, that uses average winter rainfall as part of the prediction, and then that's updated in the spring. So next slide, please, Laura. So this is the light leaf spot forecast. It shows um, the forecast that was made last year and then the preliminary one for this year, which actually was um, quite low because of um, a number of factors, including quite warm, dry weather uh, in the summer. And there's a bit of uncertainty to it because uh, the number of samples that we could take during the lockdown period uh, was quite low. So we're expecting actually because of um, high winter rainfall that this forecast will be updated in March to become much more like um, the forecast of the previous year. But it's still on the right hand side useful to illustrate um, the effects we can see of using fungicides or resistant varieties. And the the column um, to the right, which is based on resistance rating of five crop sown on the 1st of September and no autumn fungicide, 
Um, that's that's what's shown on the map. But if you actually look at the next column to the right, which is with an autumn fungicide, um, you end up with um, the amount of disease going down to only about a third of what you have without a fungus. And if you look on the far right hand side, um, the if you use the resistant variety uh, with the close to the maximum resistance available at the moment, that also is similar to having used a fungicide. So this helps you to visualise the uh, the utility of uh, either applying a fungicide or choosing a resistant variety. Next slide, please. Now, uh, a different approach is used for sclerotinia, um, and this particular um, spring, we will be um, uh, monitoring uh, spores in the air in different parts of the country. Uh, this is a past example of some work we did with ADAS and Velcourt, uh, funded by AHDB. Uh, and you can see a graph here, which are numbers of sclerotinia spores in the air uh, in different locations over time. And you'll see uh, there's a particular peak of spores, with a, which is marked by an arrow, which was at ADAS Rosemond in Herefordshire. And that peak of spores caused 20% of crops to be, uh, sorry, 20 percent of plants to be infected with sclerotinia. So uh, we now have the ability to get samples to a lab and tested within a day or two and the results put out and this, this year that will be on the AHDB website. So look out for that. Next slide please. Uh, we also have the Crop Protect uh, app and website which has information pages for a range of different crops and um, there's also uh, similar to to what I showed with the light leaf spot um, you have the uh, ability to choose more resistant varieties which you can look up from the recommended list or just look at the untreated yield value on the recommended list to get an idea of varieties that will give you greater flexibility when it comes to managing diseases. But the, the general weather effects uh, we see is that for um, the rusts, uh, dry sunny weather in early spring, uh, but with overnight dew really gets these diseases going. Whereas for septoria in wheat and rhynchosporium in barley, it's wet weather that gets those diseases going. So you can get a feel for which diseases are likely to be more important uh, depending on what weather you've had. Next slide. OK, well, that, that, that was me. So just thank you uh, to the past um, colleagues uh, that have helped with this work and thank you very much for your attention. Back to OK, Lynn. thank you, John. Thank you for that nice presentation and apologies again for the slightly strange start. Um, I'm looking in the question box. I, I do have a question. Um, and the question comes from Catherine Lamborn and she's saying, would you usually suggest applying a fungicide when using a, a resistant variety to protect both? Yes, that's a, a really good um, comment from Catherine. Um, as a strategy to protect both varietal resistance from being eroded, and also to um, give us a longer life of, uh, of fungicides to protect against fungicide resistance. Actually, an approach in which we use, you know, both belt and braces, if you like, um, good varietal resistance and fungicides together um, can help prolong the durability of both of those things. And I think actually we may be getting a mention of that later from um, some of our, our colleagues uh, yeah. that, that work in mathematical modelling. Yeah, we have done some modelling on that, John, about which is the best strategy when you've got both as an option. So that I think that may come up. Um, there's another question from Andrew Barr. Are we any closer to getting in-field real-time sclerotinia spore detection? Yes, thanks to challenge. Andy for that, that question. <laughs> um, 
it's um, it is something we're still working on. Uh, we were hoping to be doing it this spring, actually, but we, we'll still be relying on the method where samples are sent back to the lab, which unfortunately causes a delay. And that was because uh, during the COVID lockdown, both you know the first and the recent one, um, we've been able to unable to um, progress our lab work sufficiently to to be able to offer that particular service robustly this 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 time and the issue is that occasionally we get um, inhibition of our of our assay that's done automatically in the in the device that's a, a, like a lab in a box sitting out in the field and that's caused when there's a lot of dust in the air and various chemicals in the dust inhibit the uh, the reaction and we, we've been making some really nice progress to prevent that. Um, so I'm hoping that when, once we've got that all tried and tested, we'll be able to offer that um, hopefully uh, in a year's time. So thanks, Andy. OK, John, there's one more question I'm going to take. If you can answer it, it's fairly short if possible. It's anonymous, but it says, how significant can fully balanced nutrition be to mitigating crops being susceptible to diseases? It's a really interesting question, I felt. It, it is, and there, there, are, there is some evidence that um, various trace minerals um, that are perhaps a bit neglected in certain systems um, and perhaps a bit more available when there's um, good soil health as well. So there's a soil health issue here that there's evidence that um, the provision of a balanced set of nutrients can actually make um, crops a bit more resilient to pests and diseases. Um, that said, there's also a case that um, having too many nutrients uh, can create such lush soft foliage that it actually encourages some diseases like rusts, for example. Um, so it's a bit of a complicated situation and I think it definitely needs further research to understand that a bit more. Always the scientist's answer, John. Thank you.